Sticking with the use it category, I'm pleased to present to you our graduate winner in the 2014 Lemelson MIT National Collegiate Student Prize competition, Benjamin Peters. Ben? All right. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Ben, uh, and and I'm gonna hit it again. All right, and I'm gonna talk to you about parallel convergence. Pretty pretty fancy title, I know. Uh, but really, what I'm want to talk about is sort of my approach to research and kind of life in general. Uh, not necessarily. I'm going to use my, uh, you know, my invention stuff as a, uh, you know, a means to convey what I want to talk about. But I really want to talk about kind of how I go about, you know, inventing or you know, engineering or whatever it is I do uh, sometimes. So parallel convergence. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's it's kind of like I'm trying to say uh, accidental invention on purpose. Trying to make things accidental but doing it on purpose. So what does that mean? Well, it's how to have fun building neat stuff, but make it look like you're doing serious work, <laughs> which is really important for engineering and academia and everything. All right, so this is, for, this is for you kids here. All right, parallel convergence, accidental invention on purpose. And that's our, that's our title. This is showing you how iteration is important when you're developing something. <laughs> yeah, so now we can start the presentation. OK. so. What, is, what does parallel mean? Uh, well, there's a few definitions, and one of them is on there, right there. Uh, uh, the first definition is an object, which is, uh, can, I, can I leave this circle thing? Is it OK? Yeah. OK. <laughs> so I'm going to use this blackboard here uh, to demonstrate what parallel means you know, for vis visual interpretation. Hold on. So, what I mean here, whoop, OK. Sorry, that was not intentional. OK. So these are parallel lines. And oh, man, I should have practiced this. Uh, so objects that are side by side, having the same distance continuously between them. So pretty straightforward stuff. You probably know what that means already. But the, another definition of parallel is um, involving the simultaneous performance of operations, so doing lots of stuff at the same time. Um, so if I were to, oh man, if I were to like, like uh, for these lines here, like let's say um, uh, I'm going to be, you know, uh, for this line uh, in this activity, I'm going to be standing up. In this act activity, I'm going to be breathing. So I'm doing, you know, parallel activities. So they're happening at the same time. Um, and uh, uh, if, if you plot these here on the uh, you know, little axes coordinate system, we have time here like that. And we have uh, you know, our, our activity. I always wanted to do this, so I'm just going to go ahead. Uh, <laughs> activity and time on two different axes. And we can you know, plot those through time, so they're parallel. Um, <laughs> so to describe this further, I'm going to be uh, talking about a, uh, a parallel parable or a story describing something that's in, in parallel. Uh, it's another parallel reference there. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, the specific parable I'm going to talk about is the development of the digitally reconfigurable mold, which is uh, what I'll be talking about uh, today. Uh, which is the, uh, the concept here is to make a, a surface that's uh, composed of a number of parallel pins. Uh, that can be reconfigured to a lot of different geometries for use in molding, display. You might have seen them as a common desktop toy, a pin art, pin pression toy. Um, but the, um, the problem here is uh, if I have lots of pins, how do I control all of them? How do I electronically control all of them and make it reconfigurable uh, you know, to a lot of different geometries? Uh, and this, this array up here is about uh, uh, t uh, 11,000 pins, and you need 11,000 motors to move those if you did it conventionally. So how do I, how do I have 11,000 motors in a machine? It's going to be crazy expensive. Uh, I need to figure out a way to make it uh, more cost effective. Less motors, more pins. Everybody is happy. So 
I uh, started working on a few prototypes. Uh, this is my senior year, and I you know, iterated, developed stuff. This isn't really that important, just showing pictures of things that I made, and you know, developed uh, more and more products as time went on. And uh, you know, um, uh, through my undergraduate and masters, I came up with a, a pretty good portfolio of work that uh, helped to show that we could do um, sort of the things I was talking about, developing a, uh, actuation techniques that don't use as many motors as you have individual pins. But uh, kind of in the background while all this was happening, there's chalk everywhere. Um, <laughs> while all this was happening, I uh, was doing other stuff. And this is kind of what I want to talk about now. So not not my research, actually. It's the other stuff that was happening in the background. So I did a project making a CNC crane, uh, a whole bunch of winches attached to a bunch of batteries flying around the room. This is for making a, a building-sized 3D printer. So it's just an experiment. I uh, built a master lock cracking machine for a class. Uh, it, it opens a master lock in about 60 seconds or so. It's pretty cool. Um, this is an electrode discharge machine that uses pencil graphite as the electrode. Also pretty cool. Uh, this is a uh, uh, self-balancing electric unicycle. This is a, a single-use disposable monocle project I worked on. This is a, uh, a light that lights up on body heat temperature differential. This is a solder alloy material that you can laser apart with a, you know, a CO2 laser. This is a, a pumpkin carving robotic arm attachment. <laughs> this is some superconductive uh, levitation uh, ceramics I was working on. This is a, a curling broom that collapses. There you go. Uh, I did some curling and uh, made a broom that you could take on the plane with you, because I always get uh, you know, half arrested every time I try to do that. <laughs> a mobile office. I can drive around and take my research with me. A more comfortable mobile office. <laughs> it's a more mobile lounge. Uh, a, a bandage device for dolphins. This is for a medical device class. Uh, big foam Legos for another random project. Uh, they're cast uh, dimpled paintballs to fly further, a machine to make those. Uh, night and all inkjet uh, valve that didn't really work super well. And this project here. This is a pencil that grows. It's a pencil with a seed inside. And uh, so all these were happening while I was doing like, it's like one year of my master's. And uh, so, so you, can, you can take this as a lesson to, you know, oh, you can do lots of things, but you know, not all these projects actually got finished is another thing to realize. So <laughs> take that with uh, how you will. So this here is a, um, is a machine that uh, makes those pencils. And I was working on a factory, this automated factory, to make those pencils automatically. Uh, and uh, while I was doing that, I uh, investigated a lot of different uh, pieces of technology, one of them which is this vibrating parts feeder. Let me turn it on here. I think it's used for uh, sorting parts and spitting them out into the uh, larger pencil making factory. And uh, of course, it's not plugged in. There we go. I turned that on also. Sorry about that. <laughs> so it's spitting out parts. But also, you should notice here, there's a little screw coming loose. And I noticed this too. And it made me think of something. So on a totally unrelated project, I found a unique principle that allowed me to develop a new actuation technique for moving pins in a surface uh, using this unique vibration uh, actuation technique. And so back to our plot here, we, we see these two parallel projects. One of them you know, being your pin project, one being your pencils. If you think these lines are parallel, but if you trace them out far enough, take them you know, to a, a long enough time, you know, they might eventually converge. Parallel convergence. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, you know, maybe they weren't perfectly parallel as much as you thought initially. So uh, I think you have more slides here too. Oh, here. This is another example or another a schematic of how this vibration technique works. Uh, Jostling the the, uh, the screws and kind of imparting a, a you know a, a torque on on one selected screw. This is a 3D view. I made it a nice GIF for you kids out there. Uh, there's there's some math involved as well. Um, so 
I mean, it's pretty obvious from looking at it here. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's that math. Um, but uh, this was actually really important to do because it, it helped me uh, you know, learn what's actually happening at a fundamental level versus, because what was interesting is I, uh, I got the system working before I even knew what was happening in it, um, which uh, you know, is, is usually the way it goes for me. Um, and uh, I ended up backing out all the math out of it and figuring out the fundamentals of what was happening. And it was like not what I expected. So it was, it was sort, of, you know, sort of by accident, but uh, it was on purpose. Uh, here's some more math, you know, another effect, you know. Can you let that wash over you? Um, okay. And uh, if you take that math and you plug in the relevant uh, parameters for a model and you plot those, these two critical frequencies that you can derive from this, this math, it's not really worth going into, but you can actually um, predict where the system will... Uh, will actually work, uh, you know, wh what, what frequencies you need to drive these, these, these screws at to make them uh, actually come undone and, and to move. Uh, and so the critical frequency is around uh, 30, 40 hertz. You can listen here. I don't know if you... Oh, that sounds like it's... Oh, it sounds like 30, 40 hertz, you know, roughly. <laughs> but it is, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so you can see here, in this model, uh, I had dialed in the parameters and shown that my theory matched practice. So it's finding, finding it, or figuring out how to get it working in the first place with you know, a, kind of a, a random model, and then finding theory to that back that model, and then verifying it again with a, a new setup. That's like science, I guess, right? <laughs> or at least something. Um, so uh, the future of this project, uh, uh, since we've characterized the sort of governing equations that, that allow me to uh, move these, these screws in high resolution, I want to make a super high resolution array so you can make very uh, you know, uh, dense, dense pin arrays and you can make high resolution um, molds for making you know, unique parts, uh, but very quickly. Um, being a, being, you can make, make uh, parts as a formative process, being made in a mold. There's subtractive and additive and informative. Uh, so this would be the first physical display that's actually like really affordable. Um, and being that this is the field of reconfigurable pin tooling, I wanted to leave you with a little bit of quote here that I ain't fooling about reconfigurable pin tooling. <laughs> I came with that myself. So uh, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I know. So the next time you go home and watch Goodwill Hunting, it's on TV, and you look at the equations on the chalkboard. It's also math, yeah. It's bad. <laughs> Couple minutes for question and answer. Here, please. Can you back the screws up once they come out? Is there a way to vibrate them back down? There is. <laughs> <laughs> You actually just reverse the, uh, like you're, you're kind of jostling them one way, you're going to jostle them the other way. It's, it just kind of reverse the, uh, the pattern you, you do in it. It's kind of an inverted pattern. It's like, it's like yeah. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Any other questions? Back there. How many screws can you actuate at one time? How many screws can you actuate at one time? <laughs> uh, yeah, about, about, ideally about one in six, um, as long as the patterns aren't interfering. Um, but, uh, you know, that varies on what pins you want to actuate at once. But uh, with a high-resolution array, the pins will be very small. You have a stiff preload on the edges. You can pulse them at very high frequency because the critical frequency will be very high. Like, let's say, in, like, the kilohertz range, so you're pulsing them many thousands of times a second, and they all look like they're moving at the same time. It's like a CRT screen. is like a single dot, but it's, it looks like a whole screen, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. What he said. Next question. Uh, Carol? How, how big can you make it? I mean, do you have limits? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, the, the primary limitation for like the size of the array is really have to do with the um, kind of the amount of energy you want to put into it and the mass of the screws, because you're, you know, um, you know, force is, is mass and acceleration. You're putting acceleration 
into these masses, you get a force from it, and uh, higher force, higher force times distance is energy, and uh, there you go, math. <laughs> there you go. Uh, super small. I was actually thinking, because like, you know, like, uh, like carbon nanotubes are kind of like a helix shape, like almost like a screw. If you could get carbon nanotubes, this is not possible, but you could get carbon nanotubes all packed together, maybe that could, that could be some kind of, it's, it's totally not possible. Though. <laughs> <laughs> There's no real limitation in the governing equations that like limits the radio, radius or anything like that. Just kind of you know, different uh, governing parameters and energy requirements, I think. Right? It's, it's pretty apparent from the math, though, you guys. So. <laughs> I haven't really made actually many molds of, because you can see the resolution is actually pretty poor. Uh, so anything I would make would look like a golf ball kind of surface. And, and uh, it really wasn't the intention to make products from it, is really to just kind of delve into the actuation technique and kind of lay a foundation. Because like this reconfigurable pin tooling field has been around since like 1860. And like if you compare that to 3D printing, 3D printing is, was developed in like the, it's like the 19, uh, like, like, like the 1980s, yeah. Like, so it's like 30 years old versus reconfigurable pin tooling is 150 years old. So it has a lot of prior art, even though, um, what? what are you you're making a, okay. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so it has, a lot of, like, it has a lot of prior art, even though there's no real existing reconfigurable pin tools. And I kind of was wondering why that, that, that was so. So, you know, developing some more governing equations to like kind of drive this research forward, I think was really important to you know, making that a possibility in the future. Am I talking too much? No, okay. you're answering the okay. question. Last question. Where did you come up with the idea for the pencil that grows? That wasn't my idea at all. Um, <laughs> it, was it was actually part of a product design class I took here as a master student. Is that, yeah. Um, and uh, one of my teammates came up with the idea. Um, I, we all came up with versions of the pencil, and uh, mine, mine didn't look like that. Mine was like this gross-looking, dissolving plastic. Pl it was, but uh, if we would have made my pencil, they wouldn't have sold at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, it did help with the uh, you know, fabrication process afterwards. So that's, you know, that's one of the great things about being here at MIT, is you get a huge exposure to you know, amazing students and really creative people that will have a totally different perspective from you and you know, add to the, your com combined brain power, creativity stuff. That, awesome. Okay. So if you're interested in hearing more from Ben, I'm sure he's got, what is it, Thursday nights or Friday nights at the Boston Comedy Club. You can catch him. I'm just. Uh, yeah. That's not true. Thank you. Okay. We just wanted to clarify that is actually not true yet. Not true yet.